Now we're going to go back to the future, as it were, to the late uh, 19th and early 20th century, when the natural sciences and the social sciences combined to create eugenics. And let me read to you the definition of eugenics, because I think you'll immediately see the relationship to what we heard. Eugenics is defined as, quotes, the science dealing with factors that influence the hereditary qualities of a race and with ways of improving these qualities, especially by modifying the fertility of different categories of people, end quotes. Eugenics proved to be a powerful, seductive, and corrosive force motivating scientific research in much of the developed Western world at the end of the uh, 18th, beginning of, end of the 19th, in the beginning of the 20th century. For example, David Friedman, writing in a wonderful book called The Immortalists, describes the cooperative efforts of French Nobel laureate Alexis Carroll and American aviator Charles Lindbergh to perfect organ transplantation. One day in 1935 at the Rockefeller Institute, Alexis Car Carroll removed the thyroid gland, my personal favorite, from the neck of a cat and attached it to a glass pump designed by Charles Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh to perfuse organs with nutrients. Arthur Freeman describes the results as follows, quotes, after 18 days outside the body, the body that created it, the cat thyroid just removed from Lindbergh's perfusion pump was still alive and functioning, end quote. Carol and Lindbergh published their work in Science on June 21st, 1935, in an article entitled The Culture of Whole Organs, one of the most important milestones in regenerative medicine, which you just heard Dr. Carson talk about. Regenerative medicine is that branch of medicine that focuses on new approaches to repairing and replacing cells, tissues, and organs. Now, had the story ended right here, physicians and scientists would still be singing the praise of Charles Lindbergh and Alexis Carell for their pioneering work in regenerative medicine and their bioengineering feats. Unfortunately, both men were enraptured with eugenics, and they believed that their work should benefit people, but only the select few. Lindbergh was branded pro-Nazi by President Franklin Roosevelt and was banned from rejoining the military. Alexis Carroll, writing this 1935 book, Man the Unknown, proposed disposing of the unfit, in quotes, small euthanasic institutions supplied with proper gases, end quotes. He returned to France where his association with the collaboration of Vichy government and the harshness of his advocacy for eugenics led to his descent from fame to infamy. This story about Charles Lindbergh and Alexis Carroll is just one of the many stories that medical science chose to forget when it transformed eugenics into what we now call genetics. Tonight's final speaker, Edwin Black, will shine a light on our eugenic past in his talk entitled, From Long Island to Auschwitz, The Surprising Origins of the Master Race Concept. Edwin Black is an award-winning New York Times and international best-selling author and investigative reporter whose work focuses on genocide and hate, corporate criminality and corruption, governmental misconduct, academic fraud, philanthropy abuse, and historical investigations. He's a fun guy, nonetheless. Yeah. Editors have submitted Black's books and investigative reports nine times for Pulitzer Prize nominations, and in recent years, he has been the recipient of a series of top editorial awards. He has been interviewed on many network broadcasts in the United States, including Oprah, The Today Show, CNN Wolf Blitzer Reports, and NBC Dateline, as well as many of the leading uh, programs in Europe and Latin America. Black's six award-winning best-selling books are IBM and the Holocaust, The Transfer Agreement, War Against the Weak, Banking on Baghdad, Internal Combustion, and a novel called Format C. All of his books have been optioned by Hollywood for film. Please join me in welcoming Edmund Black to the Holocaust Museum.
I'm happy to be here. <laughs> I've said that Sheldon Rubenfeld has worked for a long time to get me here, and I'm absolutely delighted. He's a, he's a, a passionate man of letters, and every time I've communicated with him, I find out that he knows more than most of the historians that I communicate with. Um, I've been to many Holocaust museums around the United States and around the world. This is my first time in this one, and it is quite an institution. I've seen them big and small. I've seen them rich and poor. I've seen them in basements, and I've seen them on campuses. This is a wonderful institution. You should support it. Uh, <laughs> this is one of those Holocaust museums that is not afraid to tell the truth about what happened, who, who paid for it, and who benefited. I'd also like to say that with all my big knowledge and all my experience, it was only just moments ago when I went out into the garden and looked at the boxcar that I saw um, vindication of my mother's story, that she was pushed out of the train in a small grill and uh, was shot by uh, machine guns on the way down and was buried in a mass snow grave on the way to Treblinka. And my father found her, uh, her legs sticking out of the snow, and the two of them uh, um, lived in the woods for, for, two, for two years. Uh, although I have known this story, uh, and I've written about it, uh, and I've discussed it on film, I never had an understanding that anyone else had ever had this experience until a moment ago when I saw another man's com uh, uh, remembrance on that boxcar in Poland. So you see, there is so much to learn from institutions like this. And one of the things we're going to learn today is how much we have to learn in the future. And so I'd like you to understand that tonight, I speak for those who have never been born. Let's see how we got here to this museum, to this science of genetics, to this question. We're going to talk about academic fraud institutional racism and genocide in America before the word genocide was invented. It's eugenics, the quest to create a master race, blonde and blue-eyed, in the United States. A part of our history that we've tried to exclude and even those, such in Washington, who tried to remember it, leave out which companies were involved, because this was not just a bunch of mad scientists. This was not just a bunch of sham professors. This was money. How did eugenics start? Eugenics started as a sort of a benign philosophy. It wasn't a science. It wasn't created by a, scien by a scientist. It was created by Sir Galton, S Sir Francis Galton, who was the cousin of Charles Darwin. And he was an observer of patterns, an observer of things. He was one of the pioneers of weather maps, all those swirls. He was the inventor of fingerprinting. And he liked to spot a pattern. He liked to think he could figure out how many pretty girls there were in any given city. And he had the idea at the end of the 19th century that if a bunch of rich, cultured, intelligent people all married one another, they would have rich, intelligent, cultured kids. Of course, we all know some of the best kids come from some of the worst homes, and some of the worst kids come from some of the best homes. But that was his idea. So his idea uh, was to uh, 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 take a Greek word and Latinize it and come up, up with the word eugenics, meaning good genes, and to, prof to try to, to create a mathematical formula 
for people to accept, to uh, predict where a good marriage would take place with good offspring. Because there were so many poor people in, uh, in England. There were so, so many uh, immig immigrants. This was an attempt to improve society. This whole idea at the turn of the last century in about 1900 became exported to the United States. And it came here and converged with the rediscovery of Mendel's principles of heredity. Now everybody here knows what Mendel's principles of heredity were. It was the smooth P and the, uh, and the striped P, and you put those two P's together, and some of them were smooth and some of them were striped, and the esteemed doctor made an intelligent comment that even if this terrible disease was not transferred to the uh, first generation, it might show up in half of, of, of the second generation. And this whole idea was grappled by men of power, white guys, white guys of power. I'm talking about presidents of banks. I'm talking about ranchers. I'm talking about senators. I'm talking about judges from the post-Civil War period. Now, this is important because as we opened up the 20th century, it was being run by people from the Civil War, just like the 21st century is being run by people from the Vietnam War. And these guys were in upheaval because of the massive socioeconomic dislocations in America after the American Civil War and at the, and at the close of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. We're talking about millions of East European East Europeans coming in uh, uh, from East Europe on the East Coast. We're talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Hispanics who are now in America, in the Southwest, because we took over half of Mexico's territory after the Mexican-American War. We're talking about Indians getting off the reservation and assimilating into uh, American culture. We're talking about post-Reconstruction slaves who are emerging into freedom. We're talking about Asians coming in from the West to build the railroads. We're talking about the movement from rural to urban. We're talking about economic dislocation, demographic dislocation, and these men of power wanted it the way it was. They wanted to turn back the clock. Stop the bloodlines. And this came as they had this scientific validation. Remember, if you're a racist and you got science, you got everything. It's not your fault, it's nature. And who were these guys? Cattle ranchers, sheep herders, thoroughbred raisers, wheat farmers, and they believed that they could weed out the bad elements in society and the same way that they could improve a herd, improve a crop, and better a thoroughbred by killing off the less desirable stock and increasing the more desirable stock. What was the undesirable stock? Well, they wanted the blonde, blue-eyed Nordic. That was the race of their, of their parents and of their parentage. So they didn't want black people. They didn't want Indians. They didn't want South uh, uh, Italians, Sicilians, they didn't want Jews, and they didn't want white guys with brown hair. They didn't want hillbillies. I know that most of you 
can't imagine that years before the Jews were hiding in their apartments in Poland, waiting to be picked up for being Jews, the hillbillies were hiding in the hollers, afraid to be seen because they were being picked up by the local sheriff for having brown hair and being poor. You think I'm kidding? What kind of a crime is vagrancy? It's a guy without a job. It's a guy who's committed no crime, but who doesn't have a job. That's what vagrancy is. It's an economic crime. It's a biological crime. It's a eugenic crime. Why is it a crime? Because these guys believed that prostitution was a genetic trait, that poverty was a genetic trait. Criminality was a genetic trait. You weren't, born, you weren't born into prostitution. Prostitution was born into you. You weren't born into poverty. Poverty was born into you. And so they believed if they could get away with all the classes who were impoverished, who were criminals, who were prostitutes, who were alcoholics, they could improve the world. So first they have a racist idea, and then they got a scientific name for it, and then they invent a sham science. And this sham science was called eugenics, and it was sponsored first and foremost, I bet nobody's gonna believe this, by the United States Department of Agriculture because they wanted America weeded out the same way they wanted our herds and our pastures weeded up. So these guys came up with the idea that they were gonna save the world. They were utopians. They wanted to improve society. They were do-gooders. Their idea of doing good was killing off everybody who did not resemble themselves. And as they like to say, it didn't matter if a black man wore a toga or spoke Italian, that did not make him a Roman. And it did not matter if you were a Jew or a Hispanic and wealthy and owned a store in a town and highly educated, they feared not you, they feared your offspring because hidden in your germ plasm, as they like to say, was the evil seed. And so they wanted to get rid of 10% of the American population at a time, the lower 10th. And we're talking about the first 5, 10, and 15 years of the 20th century. You got the time frame from about 1908 until about 1915, 1920. And they formed these organizations made up of the most learned men of the day, taught in the hallowed halls of Harvard, Yale, Princeton, University of Indiana, Stanford. And so they came up with the idea of forced surgical sterilization. And so they passed forced surgical sterilization in some 27 states. And ultimately, some 60,000 Americans were forced, were forcibly surgically sterilized, mainly without knowing what was happening, mainly because they were socially, morally, or otherwise deemed unfit. And just, if you, and just when you're about ready to figure that this is North Carolina and South Carolina and Alabama, I just want you to know that at all times, half to one third of all the steriliz sterilizations in the United States took place in California. And the second runner up was Connecticut. And they came up with a way to stigmatize people with some more BS science. They said, we're gonna measure their intellect. 
So they took these immigrants that they didn't want, and they took all the black people that they didn't want to exist, that they wanted to send to the front lines in World, in, in World War I, and they tested their intellect with trick questions. They asked these Italians who knew every aria in the Italian repertoire about pop, about pop music on Broadway, and they never answered it. They couldn't answer any of the questions. They asked these, these down-home boys from the farm about tobacco ads. They didn't know what that was. They asked these learned Jews who had been studying Talmud for decades about tennis rackets. They didn't know what that was. And so by this methodology, they were able to conclude that approximately 70% of the blacks and 70% of the Jews were morons. And this test, after it went through a few reforms, we all know what it was, it became the IQ test. And yes, later the SAT. It was more than that. They had marriage prohibition. If they didn't like who you married, they unmarried you. Like in the state of Virginia. Had a whole department for unmarrying people. They didn't want race crossing. They didn't want mongrel Americans. They didn't want black people marrying Indians or white people because that immediately took the black person up and made him a kind of a white guy, and that was a whole different way to live and die. If they didn't like you, if they thought you were socially unfit, they sent you to a concentration camp. Well, the concentration camp was called a settlement house. They worked you, forcibly sterilized you, kept your assets. Sometimes they called it a sanatorium. If they didn't think they had the evidence to declare you feeble-minded, which was their favorite term, a term they never defined, a term as Goering said, I know a Jew when I see one. The eugenicist said, I know a feeble-minded person when I see one. And when they took the picture of these people who were candidates to be feeble-minded and be sent to an institution, if they didn't look nuts enough, they doctored the photographs. They actually doctored the photographs. Emin these are eminent professors. And, uh, and academicians, they doctored the photographs to make their eyes look crazy and their, and, and their face look all wacky so they would look nuts. Fraud. It was a crime to intermarry in many states between the races during my lifetime. Virginia versus Loving, 1963, was a, was, a, was a felony. Black man to marry a white woman, and vice versa. And who was behind all this? This nonsense that you were born to be a prostitute, born to be a criminal. Who was behind all of this? Well, all this would have been just so much nonsense. A couple of whacked out professors in a parlor had it not been for money. Now I'm going to give you a formula for, for discrimination, mathematical formula. A plus B plus C equals D. Formula for oppression. A is fear of the outgroup. I'm a white guy, you're an Indian. I'm a Catholic, you're a Jew. You're the outgroup. Now I can respond to you either with fear or I can respond to you with interest or fascination or brotherliness. So fear of the outgroup. Second ingredient, B, arrogance. 
you've got to not only fear the outgroup, you have to feel you're better than the outgroup. You have to dehumanize them. But it doesn't matter how arrogant you are or how much you fear your neighbor unless you have power. And that means economic muscle. And where was the economic muscle that put these wacky ideas out of the back parlor and into the oak-lined corridors of Harvard, Yale, and the legislatures of the United States. It was the Rockefeller Foundation, it was the Carnegie Institution, and it was the Harriman Railroad fortune that funded eugenics. They set up a center of pseudoscience at Cold Spring Harbor, where they studied the art of identifying which people had, a, had, had the right to exist in nature, how to predict that, and how to eliminate those who did not conform to their racist ideal. They set up pseudoscientific congresses, pseudoscientific journals, and the whole idea, ladies and gentlemen, of creating a master, blonde, blue-eyed, Nordic race, a eugenic race, was that it must be made worldwide. And so, with the power of Oliver Wendell Holmes in 1927, who agreed that Carrie Buck and her entire family bloodline should be stopped. It was better for all the world as a matter of social inoculation. And with plenty of money, they transferred the concept of eugenics to Germany. They funded German scientists. They funded institutions. They took the California statutes. They, pro they encouraged them over there. They translated doctoral theses. They paid for fellowships. And they tried to get little adopted ideas in Germany by German eugenicists, mainly who had studied in Connecticut, such as Plost, to be adopted by society at large. And one guy read this stuff, Adolf Hitler. And if you really read Mein Kampf like I did, you'll see why, see, while Adolf Hitler is putting down everybody, he's extolling the United States for being the only ones to tackle the racial dominance question. He says, we must do what America must do. And so what Adolf Hitler did was he took his militant, nationalistic, virulent anti-Semitism. He switched out the word Nordic for Aryan. He added the master race, which had been inculcated into American society for two to three decades before he ever got to write Mein Kampf. And there came the National Socialist Movement. All you know is the concentration camps and the killing. I'm here to tell you that you still don't understand what World War II was about, what the Nazi movement about was about. Don't ask me. Listen to what they say in their own words, including Goering. It was common to say National Socialism is just biology. So in other words, more than a war of territorial conquest and economic plunder, which was secondary and incidental, this was a biological war. He said it. Don't you know what those two words mean? Master race.
And I know you all know about the Nuremberg Laws, 1935, right? Full Jew, half Jew, quarter Jew, 16th Jew, 32nd Jew. What you don't know is the guy who devised those formulas was working for the Carnegie Institution. This was all attendant to our National Origins Act of 1928. Harry Laughlin got a medal from the Third Reich for his contribution. They left that out when they built most of the Holocaust museums. Where'd these numbers come from? Whose idea was this? And so the Rockefeller Foundation is paying millions of dollars during the Depression to foster Nazi eugenics. And they paid enormous amounts of money, Kaiser Wilhelm Institute and many other institutes, to the chief Nazi Jew-hating eugenicist called Atmar Vishur. And Atmar Vashur studied what all the scientists of eugenics wanted to study. He studied twins because to understand twins, he thought, was to unlock the mystery of multiplication of the master race and to unleash the power to eliminate the races that they didn't want. And so Rockefeller set up a program to investigate twins in the 30s, in the heyday of the pre-war Third Reich, by the most virulent and outspoken spokesman of anti-Semitism, eventually after World War II started, it was illegal to transfer the money o over, so they had to stop paying for sure. But his assistant continued the research. He went into Auschwitz. His assistant, his chief assistant, was Mengele. So, Mengele set up special huts to do wicked experiments in the name of medicine and science. This is where we get our concept of informed consent. It's after Mengele. And so we got that boxcar out there. And all the people getting off those boxcars, by the hundreds of thousands, by the millions, with all the barking dogs and the screaming soldiers and the crying babies, over all the noise, they heard two words. They, excuse me, they heard one word, and they heard it twice. One word, they heard it twice. Every recitation of a victim from getting off of Auschwitz says the same thing. What word did they, word, what word did they hear? They heard the word twins. We need twins. And the twins were sent to the special hut, Mengele's prized toy trophies. He put their veins together. He tried to put a brown eye into a, to a blue eye, a blue eye into a brown eye. He did terrible, painful experiments. Sometimes the parents would break into the lab and kill their children to put them out of their terrible pain, never with anesthetic. And everybody ever since has said what a terrible monster Mengele was. No one understood. Every week he was sending scientific clinical reports to his Rockefeller funded boss for sure.
This is money, people. You won't find this at the Washington Holocaust Center. And so, what stopped it all? What stopped eugenics from dominating the world? The American eugenicists sat back and watched Hitler and said, my God, Hitler is doing our job for us. Why, we've, we've been pussy footing, pussy footing around he has been doing our job with great velocity and ferocity faster, better than we ever dreamed possible. He even put the gas chambers in place. And at Nuremberg, the doctors in their own defense cited the California statutes and Oliver Wendell Holmes. They hung the American stuff got forgotten. This does not mean that today the Rockefeller Institution, excuse me, Rockefeller Foundation and the Carnegie Institution are not fine places doing great research. And after the war, we denied a lot. Because the true horror of eugenics was shown. And so eugenics renamed itself human genetics. Same laboratories, same sponsors, same funds, same university chairs, no longer. Department of Eugenics, it's now the Department of Genetics. Same Rockefeller, same Cold Spring Harbor. There's more I could tell you, but we don't have much time. So I'll wrap it up with this. Today, eugenics is the bright future of the world, and believe me, I want every medical miracle you can muster. I want them all. I want them as fast as possible, without permission. But genetics is the stuff of Wall Street today. It's the stuff of IPOs. It's the stuff of NDAs. And all these great genetic scientists working with these, genes these companies with the stain of genocide in their background, like IBM, which did the first race crossing study. While they're dazzled by the white light of big money and big accomplishment and big corporate opportunity and great science, they need to look back. And see the darkness from whence this great science came. Thank you.